Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 34, Apollo Program Flight 3, Apollo 9, Flying Spider. Last time, we talked about one of the most memorable human space flights of all time, Apollo 8, the first flight to the moon. The six-day mission captured the attention of the world and gave all of humanity a new perspective on our fragile little planet. With Apollo 8, NASA had made it to the moon, but there was still a lot of work left to do if they wanted to land on it. While Apollo 8 is considerably more well-known, the next mission was a major contributor to ensuring a successful lunar landing just seven months after our first visit. Apollo 9 was a D-type mission, a shakedown of the lunar module in low Earth orbit. This mission was originally intended to use two Saturn 1B rockets, with the lunar module launching separately. But to keep things simple, both spacecraft were launched on top of a single Saturn V, just like they would be on the landing missions. This meant that for the first time, the entire Apollo stack of S1C, S2, S4B, lunar module, service module, and command module would all be launched at the same time. The planned flight would practice all non-landing aspects of a lunar landing mission, but a little closer to home. The most important tasks involved the checkout of the lunar module. The LEM had been through countless tests on the ground, but none of it really mattered if it wouldn't work in space. The astronauts would power it up, run the computer through its paces, test the attitude control and propulsion systems, and make sure everything was working as expected. More daringly, they would also separate from the CSM and perform a number of engine tests over the course of an 8-hour rendezvous sequence. I say daringly because until they were able to redock with the CSM, the crew members inside the LEM would be orbiting the Earth in a vehicle that had no ability to enter the Earth's atmosphere. They would be close to home, but in a boat that couldn't come to shore. Less highlighted, but no less important, would be a test of the Portable Life Support System, or PLIS. You may also know this as that big backpack they wore on the moon. NASA had performed a number of EVAs at this point, but they had all been tethered. Gene Cernan almost got a little freedom thanks to the Air Force's Astronaut Maneuverability Unit on Gemini 9A, but never quite made it. In order to walk around on the moon, the astronauts are going to need their own personal life support system. They essentially needed to become tiny spacecraft. To do this, the PLIS backpack was developed. Its use during a planned EVA on Apollo 9 would be the only space-borne test of the system before its use on the surface of the moon, so it was a pretty important test. The crew for this mission contained a couple familiar faces, as well as a new one. Commanding the mission was Gemini 4 veteran Jim McDivitt. For more on McDivitt and his pre-NASA career, check out episode 14, which covered the Gemini 4 mission. This was his second and final spaceflight. Joining him as command module pilot was David Scott, Scott had flown previously on Gemini 8, episode 18, which accomplished the first ever docking in space. However, the mission soon ran into trouble due to a stuck attitude control thruster. Thanks to some quick thinking and skillful piloting between Scott and his crewmate Neil Armstrong, the mission ended with a successful landing, if a little sooner than expected. This is his second of three spaceflights. And rounding out the crew was astronaut rookie Rusty Schweikart. Russell Rusty Schweikart was born on October 25th, 1935 in Neptune, New Jersey, apparently with space already in his blood. After a childhood spent working on his family farm, he received a scholarship from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering. He then spent a few years flying as part of the Massachusetts Air National Guard before returning to MIT for a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics. In 1963, he was chosen as part of the third astronaut group, making him part of a new wave of non-test pilot astronauts who had a stronger academic background. This cultural shift would be a source of friction in the years to come. There was an increasing difference between the Mercury-era astronauts and the ones joining now. Fast-forwarding about 40 years... In 2002, Schweikart was one of the co-founders of the B612 Foundation, a group dedicated to detecting near-Earth asteroids and protecting the planet from them. This was his first and only spaceflight. If you'll recall, Apollo 9 was originally to have been Apollo 8, 
but had to be delayed due to the ongoing issues with the lunar module. Well, on February 28th, 1969, everything was finally ready to go, except whoops, the entire crew has a cold. What is with astronauts getting colds? Since the entire crew was sick and had trained so long for this specific mission, no swaps were made with the backup crew, and the entire NASA infrastructure simply waited. A few days later, on March 3rd, 1969, everything was ready again for realsies this time. At 11 a.m., for the second time, a human crew were pressed into their couches by the mounting force of a Saturn V. The S-1C first stage provided a powerful and smooth ride. The S-2 got a little bouncy with just enough pogo oscillation to keep people worried, and the S-4B quietly finished the job of inserting the mission into low Earth orbit. About two orbits after launching, you know, two whole trips around the world, who can keep count, the proper switches were thrown and the CSM separated from the S-4B stage. The adapter panels floated away, now being completely jettisoned instead of merely peeling back. With a few puffs of the reaction control system, Jim McDivitt turned the CSM around again and prepared to return to the S-4B and extract the precious cargo within, a maneuver known as transposition, docking, and extraction. In order to pull off this tricky task, McDivitt had a number of aids at his disposal. Most obviously, the left and right seats of the command module had small windows dedicated to the final moments of rendezvous and docking. If you imagine that the blunt end of the spacecraft was backwards, these windows looked forwards, allowing the astronauts to see what they were approaching. Mounted in that window was a device known as the Crewman Optical Alignment Sight. I'm not sure how the acronym is pronounced, but I'm going with COS. The coast used some optical trickery to create the appearance of a target reticle on top of and at the same distance as the rendezvous target. That target, rather than being the LEM docking mechanism itself, was a small indicator to the side of the LEM. This was a small circle with a T-bar placed a foot or so in front of it. The idea was that if the CSM target reticle was lined up with this docking target precisely, and the bar didn't appear to be poking out to the side, then the CSM's docking mechanism was aligned with the LEM docking mechanism. So for all the training and tooling involved, the task was essentially to just keep the reticle on the target while moving forward at a nice, gentle pace. Once the two spacecraft came into contact, it was time for their docking mechanisms to get to work. This is obviously an audio-only format, so I'll do my best in describing these mechanisms, but I recommend you just do a quick query in your favorite search engine for Apollo Docking Mechanism so you can get a good picture. Apollo used a probe and drogue type docking mechanism, somewhat similar to Gemini. The big difference was that unlike Gemini, the docked configuration would need to contain a pressurized tunnel for the crew to pass through, which made this whole thing a little tricky. On the CSM side was the probe. You can imagine a pole supported on three sides by shock absorbers. At the end of the pole were a few small latches that would get the docking process started. Around the edge of the docking port were 12 larger latches that would keep things more stable. On the LEM side, there was a large inverted cone, the drogue, and receptacles for the latches on the CSM probe. The cone was there so that if the probe came in slightly off target, it would guide it towards the center where it needed to be. This is actually depicted in the film Apollo 13 pretty well if you want to take a look. Once the probe found the center of the drogue, its three small latches would engage, a condition known as soft dock. Next, a system in the probe would pull the limb in tight, allowing the 12 larger latches to find their receptacles and create a stable connection, a condition known as hard dock. With 12 latches around the edge of the tunnel and some silicone rings squished between the spacecraft, a dependable pressurized connection was formed. McDivitt apparently learned some lessons from his attempted station-keeping with the Titan II upper stage on Gemini 4, since he performed transposition and docking like a champ. One thing I really enjoy about this podcast is that in just about every episode, I stumble across some minor detail that I had just never heard about before. In this case, it's that after the LEM had been docked with, but before it could be separated with the S-4B, the astronauts would pressurize the tunnel between the CSM and the LEM, open the hatch, and connect some electrical umbilicals. This was to ensure that at all times the LEM had its electrical system connected to something for monitoring, either the S-4B or the CSM. The more you know. 
Lem extracted, the S-4B drifted away before firing its engine again, destined to wander around the solar system forever. And for the first time, the entire Apollo spacecraft stack of command module, service module, and lunar module were flying together. After a long day and with longer days to come, the crew settled in for their first sleep period on orbit. And after the fitful, staggered sleep cycles of Apollo 7 and 8, the entire crew were allowed to sleep at the same time. What luxury. The next day, one of the first tests was to fire up the big SPS engine in the back of the service module to see how the docked configuration behaved. The SPS had been tested before, but now the CSM had a whole other spacecraft stuck on its nose, held in place by nothing more than 12 docking latches. Would it wibble? Would it wobble? Once again, it turns out that the men and women on the ground knew what they were doing, and the configuration was stable. Well, I'm sure he didn't expect any issues. After the burn, David Scott looked out the window and said, The Lem is still there, by God! The next day, the crew awoke and began the arduous task of putting on their bulky spacesuits. That's because today's main task was to fire up the Lem for the first time. And considering that the LEM was basically an aluminum balloon, it was probably a good idea to be wearing pressurized spacesuits just in case something went wrong. Unfortunately, space sickness struck again, and spaceflight newbie Rusty Schweikart's breakfast decided to come back to say hello. Being a true team player, he managed to hold it in his mouth until he could get to a vomit bag, avoiding a messy zero-gravity situation. Side note, when I started this show, I did not imagine it would be so gross. Despite the bulky suit, Schweikart was able to get into the docking tunnel, remove the docking probe, and pass through into the LEM, soon followed by McDivitt. Much of the day was spent with McDivitt and Schweikart powering up the LEM in the proper sequence and checking out various systems. The electrical system had no issues, and LEM startup proceeded smoothly. A lengthy test of the descent propulsion system also known as the DIPS, proved that the engine that was so troublesome in testing flew like a dream. McDivitt manually cycled the throttleable engine, the only one in the entire Apollo stack, through various power settings and encountered no issues. Next, David Scott put the CSM into free drift mode, and McDivitt fired up the LEM's own reaction control thrusters to give them a whirl. Again, no issues. Except Schweikart suddenly vomited again. Come on, Rusty! The main item for the agenda for the following day was a spacewalk designed to test the Pliss life support backpack, as well as demonstrate an alternative mode of crew transfer. The plan was for Schweikart to don the Pliss, exit the LEM door to the top of the ladder, then crawl hand over hand to the hatch on the CSM. He would then poke his head in, essentially proving that he could have gotten in, and then work his way back to prove that the reverse would also work. However, with two instances of sudden sickness, there was concern about Schweikart's ability to safely perform the EVA. After the second incident, McDivitt was forced to confer with the medical experts on the ground to figure out the best course of action. Both times he had been overcome by nausea quickly, with little warning. If that happened in the confines of a spacesuit helmet, the results would be mega gross at best and catastrophic at worst. To keep things simpler, the EVA was changed to just involve depressurizing both vehicles and leaving the doors open. That way the Pliss could still be tested, but it would be easier to recover from an emergency. But when he woke up the next day, Schweikart felt better. A lot better. So much better that he was able to convince McDivitt to further modify the EVA. The full inter-vehicle transfer was still deemed to be too risky, but Schweikart and Scott would now perform a sort of stand-up EVA through the doors of their respective vehicles. The EVA amounted to not much more than Scott and Schweikart waving at each other and taking photos, but the all-important Pliss backpack worked perfectly, paving the way for lunar surface operations. For the hour or so that he was outside, Schweikart was essentially his own little spacecraft. He was even given a call sign in reference to his flaming red hair, Red Rover. Schweikart's brief bouts of nausea were likely a contributing factor to his lack of future flights. This is really a shame, since he proved himself as a capable astronaut, up to the arduous task of being the first lunar module pilot to, you know, actually fly a lunar module. It's especially a shame in light of a fact that became clear during the many space shuttle flights to follow. Space sickness is really common, 
It generally passes within a few days, hey, it was flight day four that he felt better, and leaves the stricken astronaut free to perform his or her task free of an upset stomach. Ever wonder why the shuttle crews rarely do press conferences in the first few days of a mission? Yeah. The next day was the big one. The crew woke up, suited up, and prepared for a long and risky test. With David Scott in the command module, and Jim McDivitt and Rusty Schweikart in the lunar module, the tunnel was closed, and the two vehicles separated. It was at that moment that a problem emerged that was long anticipated, but had a happy and easy solution. What do you call the spacecraft now? Up until this point, each piloted spacecraft had its own mission designation, so it was no problem. But now we would have two distinct spacecraft from the same mission. The solution was to revive the Mercury-era practice of allowing astronauts to choose call signs, and thus unofficial names, for their spacecraft. So what did our intrepid crew choose for their state-of-the-art spacecraft bristling with cutting-edge technology? Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Gumdrop and Spider. Spider, the lem, is pretty obvious. It's not hard to glance at the lem and see these spider-like features. It's also the source of my hopefully delightfully baffling episode title. But what's the deal with Gumdrop? It turns out that when transporting the command module, it was wrapped in bright blue plastic. The astronauts saw a big shiny blue cone, and they had their name. NASA PR was a little worried about the undignified name, but the practice of Apollo vehicles getting their own names stuck. Spider gently drifted away from Gumdrop and then activated its RCS thrusters in order to perform a sort of slow motion dance in order to allow David Scott in the CSM to get a good look at it. Everything looked great, so Spider drifted off to begin the day's task. The plan was to test the descent propulsion system, the ascent propulsion system, and the ability of the two vehicles to rendezvous and dock again. In one sense, this was no more dangerous, and maybe even far less dangerous, than flying the lem around the moon, but something about sending two guys out around the Earth with its big scary atmosphere in that little vehicle slathered in mylar foil really spooks me. If they were not able to rendezvous and dock, there would be no way to recover McDivitt and Schweikart. Over the next eight or so hours, a series of maneuvers were performed that allowed the two spacecraft to drift further and further apart, while setting themselves up for a simulated lunar rendezvous at the end of the day. At one point, the LEM and its crew were over a hundred miles away from the command module and its nice big heat shield. One especially hairy moment of the flight plan was when LEM staging was performed, dropping the descent module off the back and leaving just the ascent module. Though they wouldn't be immediately igniting the ascent engine, the so-called fire-in-the-hole burn that would be used on the moon, there were still a lot of valves, wire cutters, and other devices that had to work properly. With a thud, the descent stage dropped off, gold foil flew everywhere, and Spider was suddenly a lot lighter. The crew of Spider next used the ascent engine to alter their orbit such that they would drift right back to Gumdrop. And sure enough, not long after, the two spacecraft were reunited. McDivitt found docking to be a little more challenging than expected due to the need to look straight up through a small window in the LEM ceiling in order to see where he was going, but docking was performed with no problems. First soft dock, then hard dock were achieved, the tunnel repressurized, and the crew of Apollo 9 were together again. Once the crew was safely transferred and the hatch was buttoned up, Spider was again separated, this time to perform a lengthy automated test of the ascent stage. After that, it would burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, its mission complete. The next five days were considerably more relaxed, filled with a lot of photos, a few science experiments, more SPS engine tests, and general spacecraft housekeeping. Despite the somewhat lighter workload, the lengthy mission duration was desired as a further test of the CSM's ability to weather the long flight to and from the moon. The crew were able to put the challenging first half of the mission behind them and enjoy a more relaxed pace before returning home. 10 days, 1 hour, 1 minute, and 151 revolutions after lifting off, Gumdrop gently splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean. Within an hour, the crew had been recovered, and the usual post-mission debriefings had begun. Apollo 9 is not the most well-known flight, but it was certainly an important one. 
The years of training that McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikart committed to it ensured that the difficult mission was accomplished with no major incidents, allowing it to fade into the background of history outshone by the flights to come. In only the second ever flight of the lunar module, it proved that the spindly little spacecraft was up to the challenge to come. The road to the moon was clear. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. We're going back. To the moon, actually. Apollo 10 would be a full dress rehearsal of the first lunar landing and would get just about as close to landing as you can get without actually doing it. So join us in two weeks as we wonder how NASA convinced Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan to fly down to only 50,000 feet above the moon before turning around and flying home. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.